To win, you will have perseverance. To lose, you give up easily. That is a painful maneuver. That is all over. To win, you believe in yourself. To lose, you doubt yourself. I believe I'm going to win. To win, you have to focus. You keep moving forward. To win, you take risks. A lightning strike win from the Brazilian. Jimmy leaves the ground. Nice play, knee. You overcome challenges. You find opportunity. You set your goals. Give me that belt. You take action. He's done. He's done. He's out cold. You choose your attitude. That is the picture that will make the headlines from here. Be a winner. The countdown is over and the night has arrived. Much anticipated in historic Dublin where all eyes tonight will be on three arena as two of Ireland's favorite sons both step into the Bellator cage for the biggest fight of their lives. Peter Queerly and Patricky Pitbull for the lightweight world title. James Gallagher and Patchy Mix in what could very well be a number one contender fight in the Bantamweight division. John Brandy, John McCarthy, sometimes you just get excited about certain nights. This is certainly one of them because the lightweight world title fight not only has a native son fighting for the title, not only has the story of Patricio Pitbull surrendering the title so the number one contender, his brother, could fight for it. John, it's also a rematch of a very good fight that ended with some controversy six months ago. It was an outstanding fight between two guys that really fight different styles. One guy with a ton of power in Tricky Pitbull, a guy that he can put you out with one shot against a guy who doesn't have that same kind of power, but he's got a tenacity about him. He's never been stopped in a fight. He's been hurt. We've seen him hurt, but he never stops, and he always comes back, and he gets the win. And so he drags his opponents with his cardio and his pressure. He drags them into deep water, and he drowns them, and that's what he wants to do tonight against Pitbull. The first fight ended when doctors stopped it because of the cut that Patricky Pitbull suffered. There was a ton of blood in that first fight. There will be bad blood in the co-main event tonight. But before we get there, let's take a look at what's on tap when we go live on Showtime at 5 o'clock Eastern, 2 o'clock Pacific. If you have not seen Ilias Bullard yet, an extraordinary kickboxer with outstanding hand speed, the veteran Daniel trying to keep another young contender at bay in that featherweight division. But all eyes here will be on that co-main event as James Gallagher and Patchy Mix are fighting with high stakes and with a lot of ill will towards each other that only escalated yesterday at the weigh-in. Boy, you said it right. You talk about ill will, and it intensified when Patchy Mix did not make weight. James Gallagher came after him saying, you're unprofessional. Your entire family is embarrassed by you. Your ancestors are embarrassed by you. I mean, he went after him with everything. Patchy Mix just took it all and said, we will see tomorrow night. Both of these guys are looking for that spot to be the next guy to challenge for the Bantamweight title. They both are outstanding, 11-1, 14-1. This is going to be a superb fight. Nope. Don't forget the Bantamweight world title will be decided four weeks from tonight at Mohegan Sun between Kyoji Horaguchi and Sergio Pettis. But first, we begin with the prelims, and there's always something fascinating, something you have to watch about two guys both making their pro debuts in the same fight. And now, your first fighter ready to make his way to the cage, Yusuf Nazgatov. At age 
age nine, the family of Yusef moved from Tajikistan to East Lancaster, England. Fights now out of Birmingham. Let me guess, Tajikistan's on your passport, right? You've had that stamp? <laughs> Long ago. Uh, keep on hitting me with these. I got to come up with one I said just now. I, I, I don't think there is. I mean, I mean there's, there's probably, a couple. There's, there's quite a few. There's probably some unincorporated hamlets somewhere <laughs> that you perhaps have not visited. I, I always find this fascinating because you could have five amateur fights, you could have three amateur fights, you could have 20 amateur fights. It's about to be real for these two young men right now. And it, you know, and this is why when people talk about the amateur program, especially in MMA, it is about learning. It's about how do you learn how to become a fighter? How do you learn about cutting weight? How do you learn about preparing for that fight and putting up with all of the pressure that comes with it, the crowd, the lights? But once you become pro, it's real because it doesn't matter if you were undefeated as an amateur or if you never got a win, everyone from this point on, it counts. And now we welcome his opponent, Steven. I'm not sure there are better fight fans anywhere in the world when a kid, granted, this is an SVG kid, John Cavanaugh kid, and a Dublin kid, but to have the opening prelim in a pro debut and have the crowd erupt gives you an indication of not only what this place is about, but what is coming later in the night. You know, and it's, you look at it, and it's amazing. And you just want to tell the poor fighter, it's not going to always be like yeah, that. Yeah. You're the opening fight. You've already got a crowd, and they're already going crazy for you. This is a special moment for Steven Costello. He's earned the nickname in the gym, the juggernaut. When you earn a nickname in that gym, you're doing some work. The former rugby player, seven amateur fights, and now 28 years old. He makes his pro debut here. Our tail of the tape for this pro debut of welterweight fighters. That's what it's about. This is the first fight for both of these guys. They got a lot riding on this. There's pressure out there. Let's see which one handles it best. To Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator 270. The prelims begin now here at Three Arena in Dublin, Ireland, as we are set for three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing the blue corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 170.8 pounds. Tonight, he makes his professional debut fighting out of Manchester, England, by way of Tajikistan, Yusuf, not the And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in 171 pounds. He too making his professional debut. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland. Stephen the Juggernaut Costello in charge. Your referee, John English. A great moment. Neither knew whether to go forward to touch gloves or not. It's all about heart, learning. Heart racing a mile a minute right Will now. You good? These two. Round one. Come on. Biggest difference to you between the last couple of amateur fights and the first time you were pro, besides the obvious length like of round, that obvious stuff, what's the difference? Well, there, there are obvious things as far as rule sets and what you're allowed to use as a weapon and what you're not. You know, knees to the head and face are not never allowed in any kind of amateur competition. Beautiful kick right there. Walked into a short left. Though. Grabbed a lot of shorts right there, and he's holding yeah. on to the shorts. But you're talking about guys that now it's it's all real it's all there the, these five minute rounds make a big difference so in the gym you've got to be doing those shark tanks you've got to be with a lot of people and getting yourself prepared for the length of what professional mma is and we talked about this before can you 
can you wait too long sometimes to turn pro? Can you have too many amateur fights? Can you get caught up in a rut that way where, you know, it's it's probably time to try? Absolutely. You can be caught in a rut either way, both that, you know what, you are, you're absolutely ready, but mentally you just want to stay where you're at because if you end up losing, it doesn't really matter in the end. But you've got to pick that time. And somewhere in that range of 25 years of age, I think you need to be starting to look towards, if you want to be a pro fighter, now's the time. Naskatov hunting for a trip a couple of times along the fence. Nice. And one of those double unders that didn't get him. Very nice job by stop, Costello. Stop. Time. Time. Neutral. Go neutral. We got to fix your glove. We got to fix the glove. Steven Costello. Steven Costello. I need tape. What we have right now is we have an equipment malfunction. The tape on the glove actually started to come off. The glove itself was starting to pull, so that's what they're doing right now is fixing that up. I've seen people discuss this before. Can you coach your fighter during this? No, you cannot. This is the referee's time. It's not the trainer's time. That trainer gets his time when that bell rings to end the round all the way a minute through. Fingers, lots of fingers. Nazgusov, I was going to say he says he's comfortable in both stances, but everybody says that. Yeah. It, it, they, everyone says, ah, oh, I go both sides. Beautiful. The timing on the level change. Nice level change by Costello. Drives into him. Took very little energy, little effort to get him on his back. You see he's looking for that arm. What beautiful. Side control, trying to hold it, but he can't. But this is what you want to see. You want to see your fighter, even if he's getting up, which is great by Yusuf. It's a great job by Costello to try to exit that with a shot. You saw him trying to land the kick there at the end. Stay on offense. Exactly. That was not, in, not in, as smooth. In occurrence to what occurred the first time. A beautiful change of levels and then a, actually a poor change of levels. Started reaching, leaned over. We don't want to do that. We want to bend at the knees, not at the back. Still strong enough to bring Yusuf down there. And again, yep. nice job. If he's going to get up, no problem. Don't fight so much, but let me make you pay for getting up. And that shot, the last shot he got in was a function of him staying on offense when Yusef was getting up. Absolutely. Right now, Costello keeps on putting up, but his head right now is not in a good position. And this is all part of that learning process. Pro, you know, pro debut, you can't keep your head down there. Someone's going to take it, put a knee in the middle of your face. Yusef Naskatov, like a lot of guys, I'm sure, started fighting. He was the victim of bullying when he was a kid. Imagine being someone from a faraway country, moving at nine years old to the UK. Now works with kids himself. And you can see as Costello's throwing. His arms are heavy now from the grappling portion that's been happening, and he's been initiating a lot of that. But those shots, that that punch combination, is looking slower and slower because his arms are getting heavier and heavier. Moskatov, who was hunting for a triangle, just trying different things. Right now, doesn't have a triangle, but is looking for a scissor as, as far as his leg position. This is usually not good. A lot of times you're going to see guys trying to keep their hips in, but you see how he's trying yep. to, lo to locate Moving. that arm. Exactly. There he is. But he's not in a position to put the pressure on that arm the way it is. It's not in that hyperextension position. He does, doesn't have the angle right now. You see Costello is just hanging out right here. He's starting to work his way through. You see the elbow coming past the hips. No, watch the foot. And the knowledgeable fans recognized it immediately. Heavy side control here to end the round. Nice step nice. over the mount. But late in the round, can he do any damage with it? Yes, he can, is the answer.
Take a look at what happens here. Here comes the head kicks up high. Beautiful. Chambered it low, came up high. That was where he, that, that level change. But look at the chamber. And he was expecting it to be down time. He thought kicks were going to go the same place. Nice job by Costello to bring down. Here was that change. That was the good takedown. That was where a nice change of levels drove into his opponent. And then watch when he's getting up. It's like, okay, you want to get up? I'll make you pay for getting up. Great knee off of the mat. Totally legal. Outstanding timing and accuracy. A lot of offense. He won the round. And I will defer to you on this. Steven Costello to me, as you look at Yusuf Nazgatov, Steven Costello looks like a very tired young man after those five minutes. And, we, and a lot of that, we're talking about adrenaline. We're talking about that first fight. We're talking about being in here in front of this crowd. And it's not that he's not in shape. It's just there's adrenaline pumping through him, and it's making him feel tired. He's got to work his way through it. Back up, back up. Red, you good? Round two, boys, let's go, Blue. Costello moving backwards here to start round two. He is, but the one thing you want to look at with Naskatov, Naskatov is being very linear. He is not giving him angles, which makes life easier on Costello. Askatov, you notice how he's going straight linearly right into him, not stepping to the side, not taking an angle. The head is staying mostly on the center line. That's all things that Costello can take advantage of. Askatov tries to double up on the left. Again, and he walked into some trouble. That was a nice job. Naskatov read that. He saw yep. that takedown attempt coming. See damage. And figure out where that's coming from. Well, I think we were fooled by how smooth that first level change was. <laughs> well, again, and that's part of that adrenaline yeah. and everything coming. Wasn't quite as tired. Now his legs are heavier, arms are heavier, not moving as cleanly. He's still out there throwing. Both guys are throwing hard. Nice stopping of that takedown attempt. Yusuf is doing a great job right now. He's the one starting to control. Nice, yeah. great shot. Nascatop needs to stop. Throwing kicks, as we would say, raw dog, without having his hands come out first so he can hide the kicks. You telegraph those kicks, and you're going to get taken down, just like what happened. It'll be interesting to see, since we saw what Steven Costello was able to do on the ground as far as positional changes, it'll be interesting to see if he wants to stay in the guard right here or if he tries to pass again. And he, sort of, he sort of ran out of time at the end of the first round, but here he's got a lot of time to work with. And you saw in the first round when he was he moved to mount, he didn't just press down and put weight on him. He was taking his leg, bringing his leg up so he could bring power down on shots. He's got a good pass. He's got a leg lock situation here. He's put himself into a heel hook. And he, and he tapped. Put himself into a heel hook. I would. There was a moment I was pointing at the monitor late in round one because I thought he had exposed himself for that late in that first round, and Nazgatov was occupied with other things, but this time he makes no mistake. Wow, that was a very nice transition, and, and it was actually Costello that started looking towards that leg lock, and Nazgatov was the one that grabbed that heel hook, torqued it, got the quick tap. Here we go. This is a beautiful position change. Watch how he takes it, steps over, but he's in his. The, yeah, right his there. right leg is in trouble. He quickly tapped that. Was, that was a lightning fast tip. Take a look yeah. again. This is when now he, he's got nothing. No pressure on Nascatov's legs at all. Right away, tapping to, due to that heel hook. Even the referee had no idea what was going on yeah. as far as the tap. He didn't see the tap. Yeah, it came he so just, fast. Yep.
teachable moments for Stephen Costello and Yusef Nazgatov. You never forget your first. Michael C. Williams will make this official. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes by way of a heel hook. Your official time, two minutes, 24 seconds, round number two by submission. Yusuf, not the face, Nazgatov. Michael C. Williams puts Yusuf Nazgatov in the record book. With an impressive submission win, he stayed patient throughout that first round when he was getting the worst of it. Saw an opportunity, couldn't take advantage of it the first time, but the second time, he made no mistake. We are just getting started here in Dublin tonight. I'm alongside John McCarthy, but now we say hello for the first time tonight to Aiden Power, Josh Tuff. Thank you very much, Sean. As always, it is a pleasure to be at the fight desk, particularly in my hometown of Dublin, and alongside this man, my partner tonight. He is the two-time lightweight champion, and I believe he was either the body or the face or both the double for Tom Cruise in Collateral in that movie a few years ago. Sexy. Josh Thompson. Dead Looking sexy, good. Man. Look at this. Hey, look. A little bit of the great coming through. I got to shine every once in a while. Yeah, you're looking grizzly, buddy, and you're looking great. That's what I meant to say. You've been enjoying your time in Dublin, but when we look ahead to the main event tonight of epic proportions, we've got the vacant lightweight title on the line. Peter Queeley, Patricky Pitbull. How pumped are you for the rematch? I'm excited because it was, feels like unfinished business. It's something that we didn't get to see the end, a true ending to a true fight that was actually shaping up to be a really good fight. Now all we've done now is we've added two more rounds and I'm pumped to see if this gets dragged into that third, fourth and fifth round that we didn't get a chance to see in the first fight, how it's going to all play out. Do you see it as a continuation of the first fight or are we going to see adjustments from both fighters? I think you're just going to see a continuation. There will be subtle adjustments like an eye that I would be able to catch. Maybe not you, but I'd be able to catch it. But you'll tell me then. I would love, definitely to let you chime in. Thank you but, very much, buddy. Um, and with the belt on the line, it obviously raises the stakes, but how does five rounds change proceedings? Well, I believe that it's going to favor Peter Quilly as it goes into that third, fourth, to fifth round because someone like Patricky, who throws with such power, has that knockout power. Those things that normally when people possess those type of powers, they tend to slow down as the fight goes on and they wait for that big knockout punch. Peter Cooley is not that guy. He's the opposite of that person. He touches you and touches you, and he finally gets you frustrated. And when you lunge in, he's able to touch you and then potentially knock you down or try to follow up with a finish like he did with Ryan Scope. It is going to be intriguing. It is going to be electric inside the three arena. It's already getting electric, and we are only getting started. It's a privilege to be here. Back to you, Sean. All right, guys. It's going to be a magical night. You can tell already in the building. Well, two women who are both outside of fighting, have sought work in the medical profession. Tonight, we'll try to make sure that the other is in need of it. Kays Audrey Carouche. And now making her way to the cage.
Danielle, and she has not been defeated. Seven and five, more experience for Audra. We'll see what happens in this matchup. And for those streaming the fights live tonight on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you to Dublin as we get set now here at the prelims for three five-minute rounds in the strawweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot two, weighing in 114.3 pounds, point eight pounds rather. Her professional record, seven and five. She fights out of Marseille, France, Audrey Carouche. And across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot four, weighing in 115.6 pounds as a professional. She's undefeated, four wins, no losses from Mullingar, Ireland, Danny Needland. In charge, your referee, Kevin McDonald. If there were odds on the decibel level of the Peter Queerly walkout later, they'd be going up right now. <laughs> yes, they would. You ready to fight? You ready to fight? Let's go. Those of you with us now don't need us to pump that up for later. You know how special it's going to be. Goes without saying, at Danny Neal and another SBG. He'll be dotted throughout the night. One of the great ironies of the evening is that James Gallagher is no longer at SBG. Which I don't think even it was interesting watching his pre-fight media this week. That how many people don't realize that he has relocated to the States. I don't think a lot of people don't realize that, but you know, you got to do what's best for you. And that, that's the way he's looking at it, and that's what a good young fighter needs. So I think it's a smart decision by him. What we're looking at here, Danny yeah, You talk about double unders a lot. Tell, tell yeah. everybody why it's so important. Well, it's so important because you have control of the upper body of your opponent. You can take them down with the exact same type you're just seeing from Danny. The real question was, was Danny going to want to keep this fight on the feet? Because her opponent is good with her submissions and very good at the swing in arm bars, but she's not going to swing into any arm bar from that half guard position with the fence right there. Speak French by any chance? <laughs> no, I do not. Because this would be a, this would be a good time. Yeah, it would yeah. be good. Yeah. But again, what you're seeing from Audra, Karush is grabbing the head right now. That's not going to get her out of this position. That's going to actually keep Danny right where it's at. The overhook on the arm can keep Danny from using that arm. But she needs to start searching for underhooks so she can use that elevator and that butterfly hooks that you're seeing right there to get Danny off her or to reverse the position. Could very well be what he said in French. <laughs> could be, I don't know. Come on, Dito. Danny Neely doing a really nice job of using her head as a third arm. A lot of pressure down onto the head and face area of Karouche. That's keeping her pressed up hard into that fence. She's gaining position to start to do damage. Really nice, effective, efficient job by Danny Neely right now. Cormac, her striking coach, her fiance. It's been a big discussion topic. So you can see last year. Take a look at Danny's left arm. This is she's wanting to punch with that arm. There goes the arm bar. That's what I was talking about. She's quick at searching for that arm bar. So I don't think she's gonna get her from the position just because she's not able to move her hips in the right direction. But at least she put her on the defensive. It stopped that you know offensive attack that Danny Nealon was looking for. Danny passing now. Still back into the half guard position, but you're watching Danny. Watch what she's doing with her left arm. She's pressing down on the head many times of Karouche, where she can actually land elbows, but she's bringing it up and bringing that fist back to land a punch when the elbow is right there for her. That's just something when you're looking at the more experienced fighters, they start to feel those positions and go for what is actually a harder blow with the elbow. 
You saw again Karush just hanging on and pulling her in closer. But at least Karush now she can work from both sides. She can attack the arm right now. The arm she'd be attacking is the right arm since she has somewhat control of it. You see her tr trying to turn her hips, change the angle. Danny Nealon just following those hips. Very smart, effective defense. Going after the arm again. Should Danny Nealon be locking her arms together or is she okay where she is? No, she's good. She's pressing forward. She's controlling the hips, not allowing Audra to actually swing her hip through. That's stopping that arm bar attempt. And now she took away the other side. And getting her back to the fence. Yeah, this is what the fence will do. It gives the fighter an opportunity to possibly use it to stand up, but if they're not, they're trapped by it, and they're an easy target. Nice job of stepping over the leg. Beautiful side control position, almost Kazakatami. Right to nice step through again very late in the round though. She'll be able to get a couple elbows in. Good Stop. first round. Bing break. Really overall a dominant round as far as what Danny Nealon was able to do. You saw a couple of arm bar attempts from Karush, but none of them got to the point where there was ever any danger for Nealon. Audrey Karush, he did her, in her fifth fight, Danny Nealon there. You can see she stayed, for the most part, pretty calm. She, she left herself open for that arm bar for that one second. Other than that, she defended well in that top position. And that's where she's been successful throughout her four fight career is she's great at taking her opponent down controlling the position and just slowly getting herself to either a more advanced position or doing damage from the guard or half here we go you see that the legs coming up she tries to work towards punching with that left hand there she comes with the elbows, and elbows are always going to land with more impact. They cause more damage, and they get the opponent to move. There she goes right into the mount, and right away when those elbows start coming down, you see her opponent turn, starting to move to her side. Not too. Ask Patricky Pitbull if elbows can do more damage. That's the reason he lost the first fight. Big left hand. Both landing. And now Neelan in the dominant position, 10 seconds into the round. She's got her down. She, do, she does need to let the leg go. She had that leg in a position where it can work for her. And you can pass to that side. She allowed it to come back and around. But she, it seems to me Danny feels like now she understands what Karush is doing. She feels when she's starting to attack that arm and she feels like I can stop it. I'm going to use the cage to crush the space and just do damage. I want you, the, a big difference, a lot of people wonder about the punching, you know, I always look at the articulation of the, the wrist, and you'll see guys just, or, or women just hitting with that wrist, that's a, that's like what I call a one, and then if it's from the elbow, it's a two, if it's from the shoulder, it's a three. There's all the different levels of what, when someone's landing with power, you can see it, and you can hear it. it and again, going back to Queerly Pitbull 1, judges gave Peter Queerly the first round. I thought Pitbull won the first round. But you remember, at the end of that round, Pitbull had him down. Peter Queerly, even though Patricky had his back, was landing those little soft little shots, which didn't seem to do anything, but he won the round in the judge's eyes. So there were two any way you slice it. Those were two very close rounds. These have not been. No, these have not been. Danny Nealon has been able to control the position, the location, and how this fight is going to play out so far. What, what does Karoj need to do here 
whether she'll be able to do it or not. What is her best case scenario here? What has she been trying to do? Well, right now she's got to get her head. If she's not going to use the cage to get herself to her feet, she's got to turn her body position and bring herself off of the cage so she can swing to either the left or the right to go after the arm bar that she likes so much. There's, there's been no urgency on her part. I don't know the degree to which she could get up if she had her heart and mind set on it, she but she try. has no, right, she clearly doesn't have any interest in it. No, she hasn't tried to get, she's been, she's been looking for the arm attack. It's just not there right now. You can see she put her feet on hips right there, then she turns to the side. All of this right here, she has the opportunity to scoot herself back, but she's looking. Yeah. She likes the ground game, and I think she's trying to draw Danny into saying, I'm, I feel okay here, but she's starting to take a lot of shots, and those shots are going to add up. You can see Kirosh would love to crank on that right arm, but... And there's a lot of pressure right now, shoulder pressure from yep. right arm and shoulder of Danny. She's got that arm in a position where she can get that choke. But right now, the fence is working against her because she wants to bring her body to that side. Danny Neal is still working, so you're not going to get stood up from here. Uh, right now, she has the ability. If she can pass those legs, she's got, she's got the, the arm in, yeah. Choke. She's got to She's free trying that to leg. get that left leg free to step through. A nice job of using her right leg. She just let go of that. Karush was able to hold on. How long can she do that? There's the step over attempt. Watch back her head. Nice job by Karush to move her hips. She bring her back, even though it's a different side. Bring her right back into her half guard position. That's what I'd like to see yeah. from Danny Neal. Dropping the elbow. And drop that elbow, push on the head, and let the arm slide off of the head so the elbow comes right following it. It lands with power. It does a lot of damage as far as slicing your opponent. See what Kirosh is, she's looking for any kind of Hail Mary. Armbar, more anything she can grab a hold of, but that opportunity is not being afforded her. Not at all. Right now, you know, as she goes into a closed guard and then grabbing the head, the whole round slipped by with her being in the same position for about four minutes and 50 seconds of it. And again, for the second straight round, Dan Edelman lands her best shots in the final second. I instinctively just wrote down on my little book, 10-9. Should we be thinking, is there a, uh, you don't feel like there was any fight ending moment there, nope. but it was such a dominant round. It was dominant. You think, you think about it for a second. Yeah, dominant as far as positioning, she was dominant as far as being able to keep her on her back, right. but not from not a enough. dominant position itself. She did get to that a couple of times. She came close with almost getting to the point of being able to make that arm triangle work but nothing in the way. If we had 8.5, that's an 8.5 yeah. round. But it doesn't work its way all the way to that 10 -8. Have you ever been in a room anywhere where there was a discussion about there being a different scoring system that wasn't 10-9, that was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or anything I got a little bit that one. we wouldn't I got a think of too. that's you know out of the ordinary? How many times yeah. have I been in that room? Anything Probably. you liked, anything that you ever said, huh? I wonder if maybe that one could work. There's a lot of different things that can work. The biggest problem is the sport has gotten so big and now worldwide that yeah. everyone's been doing the same way. It's the changeover. Yep. It would take so much that most promotions don't want. It. We are in time. Another early round takedown. Here we go again. Yeah, you're talking what 15 seconds into the round. As you know, I talk with an icon of an official in one sport. We are approaching a time where already in minor league baseball, we are moving towards a computer calling balls and strikes and feeding it to the umpires. And so there's always, we can sit here as two old guys and say, ah, oh, nothing will ever change. But you wonder if there's an opportunity somewhere on prelim fights, 
on, you know, somewhere. Amateur fight. Amateur fight. Is there a way to try out some new stuff? I, I absolutely think there should be. I think it should be being done. I think anything to improve the sport, to improve the accuracy of the sport. I hear all the time that, oh, if you, you know, like you said with baseball, if you allow a computer to do that, then you're taking away the human element. Good. If the human element is making mistakes, let's take away the mistakes of the human element and make it sure that the right fighter gets the calls that they deserve. I mean, sports 28 years old. <laughs> so, Bruce has been hunting for an armbar for 12 plus minutes. So she's not, she's not swinging. And you, and you got to really figure out after two rounds if you haven't been able to find that arm bar. And now both ladies have a sweat build up. There's more. You're slippery here. You're more tired. That arm bar is probably not going to come unless Danny Nealon makes a huge mistake. Now there's the elbows you wanted. Oh, this is a big hammer fist. And again, this right here is what, what I want to see. I want to see Danny Nealon start to posture. You can keep the head on her head and keep your legs up like this so you can land big shots a la Tito Ortiz used to do. That's a great position. You do have to be careful of the arm bar in that position, though. Or hips in heavy like she is right now and head up and big elbows. Great job by Danny Nealon. Danny Nealon had just one stoppage in her four wins. That was by submission. Here she has just dominated in top position virtually the entire fight. Never really in danger. Uh, she has not been in danger throughout this. Right now she's going back into that half guard, but she's in a good position to do damage, and she needs to intensify the attack. This is the difference right now. This is the moment where you're going to either lead yourself into a judge's decision, or I'm going to finish this fight by, by creating more pressure and upping my output, which is what we're seeing from Danny Nealon. I love what I'm seeing. She wants to walk back into SBG on, on Monday morning with a, a knockout win. She's trying to land and work herself into a dominant position here. She got full mount in the first two rounds, but both with just seconds remaining. If she can get it here with this much time left in the round, she may be in business and she has it. Rouge gives her back. Not a good thing for Cruz, you know. Danny needs to press with her hips, keep her down, and just open up uh, with those big shots. I don't know if she's gonna make a minute 10 of this. Not if she's Kevin not McDonald's trying to stop. taking a very close look. Because all she's doing is becoming a punch. Yeah, we're done. Now. We're done. She got it. That is a really impressive thing for a young fighter because she could have easily ridden that out. Absolutely. She could have walked backwards into that decision win, but she said, I want the finish and I'm gonna get it. And you gotta love that about her and her attitude of, I'm not here just to get the win. I want to end this fight. She opened up some big shots at right hand, great mount position. And the thing to watch from Karush is nothing is coming back. No attempt to change the position. All she's doing is trying to cover. That's why the referee stops the contest. Great job, good stoppage by Kevin McDonald, and a great performance by Danny Nealon. Audrey Karush went hunting for an opportunity that entire fight that was never there. But you know, when you're walking in from that gym, your confidence level is so high to begin with. Yeah, no doubt when you've got John Cavanaugh, a guy that is just very you know, scientific about the fight and understands it, understands the mentality of it, that only can benefit you in the cage. When you're a little bit excited, he brings you down. When you're a little bit down, he brings you up. And then you get to hear your name said by Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the end comes officially three minutes, 58 seconds into round number three. The winner by TKO still undefeated, Denny Needland.
she goes to 5 and 0 could be a very very big night for SBG and Aiden Power you are from here this is your hometown you know full well that this gym there's something magical about it Speed there is as we all know including Danny challengers and champions it's far away from these bright lights where our champions are made and there is one gym from these uh, fighting shores that has produced more than any top talent in the world and it is of course SBG Art. Today's session is my favorite to do, and that is my MMA session, 11 a.m., Monday to Friday. That's where the bulk of the work gets done. That's where we look to improve everybody's skills, and then we always finish with some live work so we get to test it. There's no one there that's a beginner. You know, that's, they would be in the regular classes in the gym, maybe training in the mornings, jiu-jitsu, or evenings, kickboxing, and they have to get to a good level, and then they're in the um, this is the part I enjoy the most. The Las Vegas and Bright Lights is the part I actually enjoy the least. But being on here on the mats with such a, a great group of athletes, we're here 11 o'clock every day, we problem solve different positions, and then we get to train them live and see what's working, see what's not working. And it's a case of trial and error to try and find solutions together. And uh, this is the part, definitely the part of the game, the MMA game that I enjoy the most. So I would do this forever. The Las Vegas and Bright Lights, uh, we don't know how long that will last, it's fun, but uh, this is what it's about. And it's the technical aspect of MMA that I find fascinating. If we talk about, the, say, the elemental sports of mixed martial arts, if you look at the Olympic sports like boxing, wrestling, taekwondo, judo, you're a lifetime trying to get good at one of them. In my sport, you've got to be good at them all. When I walked into SBG, it was ten over 10 years ago now. No one knew who John Kavanaugh was, bar the tight MMA guys. No one knew who Conor McGregor was, so nothing was achieved yet. Conor wasn't in the UFC. They weren't in any position different from where I was, but there was an energy that you could just tell that you didn't know where it was going, you didn't know what was going to happen, but it was going to be special. I wouldn't be here only for the SPG gym. Everything I know about fighting was, was learned here. Um, so without SPG, the showstopper wouldn't exist. You look at John and you just, looks like your average kind of man, do you know what I mean? But his mind and how he looks and how he assesses situations, how he can read the room, how he can read your opponents, that's what separates him from, from the rest. So forever I enjoy teaching. I actually wanted to go back and teach maths. That's, that's, I just found it very rewarding to have a bunch of people and to be able to try and get across the concept. And there's the moment that every coach will understand where you're showing a move and you see someone's eyes open up. Because maybe that was a situation that they just couldn't figure out themselves, it was a problem. You helped them solve it, and it's, it's very rewarding. We had an incredible rise with Connor, but I feel this is only the beginning of a golden era of mixed martial arts that so many of them now are fighting for titles or working towards titles. And I believe Connor has kick-started this revolution almost in so many you know, good athletic early teens that were inspired by him came into the gym, we clicked, we've done 10 years work together, and now they're starting to compete on an international level and get good results, and I, I don't see this slowing down. We've just bred tough men. We've, we've seen tougher things than this, unfortunately, for, for my ancestors, and this passes down through the generations, I think. So for me, this feels normal. It doesn't feel like an unusual thing. I'm, I'm thankful for the people that have come before me, possibly, that they've had it so tough. This has been bred down into us. I'm not looking to carry on what Connor has done. I want to surpass it by double. Then I'll be satisfied. A nice insight to SBG Ireland. That is something you can relate to more than most, Josh. Training all your life with AKA in one of the top gyms in the world. No, 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 the, we call it the top gym, the, but go ahead. The top gym <laughs> in the world. I'll let, I'll let you and John Cavanaugh and the rest of them fight over that one, but you know the importance of having the right team, the right coaches, and the right environment to produce success. I have to give John Cavanaugh his due, his gym, SPG, and what he's built outside of just, not just the one here in Ireland, but all the facilities he has outside of that as well. He he has talent all across the world that has that built gyms and also that, that rep his gym. But the talent that he's built in Ireland is just, it's one of the best right now that we can talk about. You look at all the young talent that comes out of there. I mean, James Gallagher is, what, 25 years old. You know, Peter Cooley, sure, he's been fighting a long time, but he's been there since he was a young kid. There's a lot, Liam McCourt sitting just right over here to your left. Yeah, we'll be chatting to her later. There is a lot of, lot of 
wonderful talent that he has developed. And what he said, it really resonated with me the most. So when he said, you show them a technique and they finally get it for the first time. I teach kids, and even whether they're adults or they're kids, when they look you in the eye and it just they, their eyes open up, it's something special, and it's something you'll never forget. And that is what makes that's what makes him so special. That's what makes him jizz so special, and that's what's nice about this. Nicely said, Josh. Well, one of the products of SBG was James Gallagher. We now know he's training in the States. We'll chat more about that later on, but he is here tonight in a massive grudge, ma grudge match in our co-main event against Patchy Mix. And for more on this, let's welcome in Jeanette Quachi, who's with Gareth. A. Davies. Thank you so much, Aiden. Yes, Gareth A. Davis alongside me. A co-main that's going to be super exciting. Patchy Mix, James Gallagher. We cannot ignore the fact, though, that Patchy has come in a bit heavier than he should be. Yeah, I don't think it'll affect James Gallagher at all. This is a massive gateway fight for him. He's ranked number six in the bantamweight division. Patchy Mix is number three. It's the hardest opponent, I believe, he's ever faced stylistically. But Gallagher thrives on these environments. It's amazing to be back here in Dublin. They're often talked about as the pound-for-pound -pound best fans in the world. And Gallagher's one of those guys. As his super ego comes out on these nights. It's all about how he delivers tonight, what he's learned over the last year with James Krause in Kansas, having left the safety of home since he was 13 years old with John Kavanagh here in the shadow of Conor McGregor. It's a really, really big night for him. What's at stake here, though, Gareth? You know, if we had to think about what could be from this fight. Look, he will carry the whole of Strabana here tonight. If he'd been off this card, if it had been cancelled yesterday, it would have been, it would have left a, a, the card flat. Gallagher is a special character. He's special for Bellator. He's on about chasing greatness. And I think he's got it in him. Patchy Mix is a big test. He's a big guy. As you say, he didn't make the weight. Mix is here to spoil the party. Well, what a party it will be. I'm sure he will drink this in. The co-main, super exciting. But, Sean, I'm going to hand it over to you. No, Jeanette, and you can just tell the, these fans who are filing in are ready to celebrate tonight. They are ready to explode. And talking about SPG, now we're starting to see fighters. We're going to see Pedro Carvalho later, seeing fighters come from other parts of the world to come here to Dublin to train with John Kavanaugh, including the young man we're going to see in this fight. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Bobby Pellet. <laughs> The undefeated 30-year-old from Wales was asked before the fight, what's your prediction for this fight tonight? He said, I'll be talking to Big John McCarthy when it's over. <laughs> you gotta love that confidence, and I, I tell you what, he should have it because his stand-up is exciting. He's got power in both hands, he's got great kicks, he's got a beautiful spinning heel kick, and his ground game is now coming up. He's physically very strong, so a lot of times on the ground, he kind of uses too much strength, which can sap his energy. He needs to be very careful because the guy he's fighting, Nico is very good at the stand-up also, but will want to take this fight to the ground at some point. And now making his way to the cage, Nicolò Soli. Full clip, back stand up. Blue wave commando. Born and raised in Torino, Italy. You can see he represents both flags. Of Dublin is hometown now. Fun fact, Torino, Italy is where the first Bellator International show was held a over five years ago. I, I don't think, I, I don't want to let that great piece on SPG and John Kavanaugh go by without getting your thoughts on it, John, because you have seen fighters and trainers, you know everybody from all of the elite gyms in the world, and there is a, a very special feeling, it's something very unique, and it's why, as much as I applaud James Gallagher for seeking something else out, by the way, Patsy Mix did the same thing, he left Jackson Wink, so now younger fighters are saying, this is great, but I want more, but you can't deny there is 
there's a special thing about that gym here in Dublin. Oh, there's no doubt. It's it's based upon the leadership of John Cavanaugh and the other coaches that he has next to him because you can't do it all yourself. The Owen Roddies, the, D the Dave Roches, those guys are what they help drive these guys every day. And they're, when John Cavanaugh is out at a fight, they might be back at the gym taking care of business. And people just want to be part of winning. And that's what John Cavanaugh has done with SPG. He has won. And the elite gyms, particularly here in Europe, you better bring somebody in wrestling West who is elite in the world that can teach at the elite level. That, that was becoming a separation. Absolutely. If you don't bring in the very best to elevate the game of everybody, you're going to fall behind. Our tail of tape for this welterweight matchup. This is a good one. Both guys very difficult in the stand-up. Both super strong. Take a look at the reach advantage that Bobby Paulette has, though. He will try to keep Nicolo on the outside and pick him apart. To Michael C. Williams. For all those joining us tonight live in the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you to the Bellator 270 prelims as we get set now here in Dublin for a welterweight feature set for three five-minute rounds introducing the blue corner at six foot one weighing in 170.6 pounds undefeated as a professional five victories no defeats by way of Liverpool he fights out of Pristatin North Wales Bobby the body snatcher And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot two, weighing in 170.8 pounds. His professional record, three wins, one loss by way of Biella, Italy. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland, Nicolo, the Monkey King, Sully. In charge of the action, referee John English. Chant is Nico, Nico. Red, you good? Blue, you good? Round one, boys. Come on. wonder sometimes an inside leg kick you wonder sometimes you've seen fans in other sports influence fans in other places and you wonder if people watching this all around the world see what an MMA crowd can be that they can be a uh, almost a beach ball tossing <laughs> chanting soccer type crowd yeah a lot of hard feints by Bobby Paulette right now you'll notice that Nicole is not not fighting on any nope. of them, which is telling you that he's done his homework, he knows exactly what Bobby brings, and he knows how he brings it. He just heard James Gallagher talk about the homework at SPG. Flurry trying to lead to a flying knee. That was a little too much too soon, but I agree with you on that one. Just a little <laughs> press crush that space. It's like well, you're not going anywhere with it, but the beginning of the fight makes sense. You're 24 years old, Zach. You just walked in Dublin with these people here. You, the self-imposed pressure or just getting caught up in this environment, it, it's, that's a siren song right there. Yeah, I say it all the time. It's a drug you can't get anywhere else. It is so unbelievable the feeling that the athlete will get hard to explain if you've not been that person or not been in that cage and felt the energy of the crowd but Nicolo very young in his fight career but he's very very wise in the way he fights and we just need to see him settle down in this fight and you think about as we're looking at a fighter Bobby Pallet who had not hasn't fought in two and a half years all the fighters that fought in empty arenas for a year and a half Absolutely. without that drum and that's you know, some people it's like I think it actually helps some fighters but in a lot of cases it definitely took away 
from their performance because they feed off of that energy. Nice job of getting double underhooks by Bobby. <laughs> wow, run through by Nicole, but Bobby right back to his feet. I felt this was going to be a real stand-up battle with Nico finally trying to work it towards the ground, but Bobby's done a great job of just peppering the legs, change of position oh, against time, the cage. Time, time. Yep. No, 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 go neutral, go neutral. Stand over here, stand over here. That's that almost a, inevitable when the knees get up near the fence. That was a slider time, that went a time. bit outside. Just a bit. Nico solely time, trying right? to get the crowd to not harass. Bobby the Pallet, he's the one who, control, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, we know. Right, so we know where you hit him. Just shake it up. You start a timer. You got his warning. All right, it's in the clinch. You got to be in control. And this right here, okay? Bobby's in control. Continue? He needs to just take timer, his time good? and know right, boys, when he's on, ready, that's when you tell the referee, don't do it before you're ready. Wants to ignite the crowd. He's looking for the highlight. That was a nice high it was. kick. It was a good distance when he hit it. Both guys shielding really high. So you can see guys going to the body just like you saw Soli right there. When a guy's shielding so high, bringing those arms way up and those elbows are up, it does give you the opportunity to take that body and do damage to it. Good level change, and here is Soli going to work immediately on the ground. These are two big welterweights. Really big. It's Bobby. Is one of the top position here. Normally he likes to be in the stand up, but he will do ground and pound work and he will posture up and try to do big damage. You saw Bobby doing a great job of taking away that right arm of Soli. That's what kept him on his back. Soli going a deep. Underhook off neck. He's got to be careful. Yeah, this is a dangerous spot. You walk that high in the cage. Yep. Go and hook it. So his legs are so long. See what he's going for. He's trying to lock him to get that. Go and hook it again. Great That's job by Bobby Plata to bring it back, square those hips up. You saw Soli doing a lot of good work of off angling. John English warning him about getting the toes in the fence. It's awful hard when you swing your leg around if you're the fighter not to keep your toe hot and you're push trying to push off it again. It's hard to, you have to imagine, as a fan watching, you have to imagine that it is a wall and not a fence. It's a fence so we can see. Yes. But if you're taking a look at who's actually been doing the better work overall on the ground, yeah. Bobby Pellet has been in a position where he's been holding a lot, not landing any shots really, and being on defense. Time! Stand up! Which makes that a kind of difficult round to figure out. <laughs> well, Nico thinks he won it. Not sure he's wrong. I'm not sure he's wrong either. At least he's having fun. Uh, that's part of it. You know, a lot of people say, how do you have fun when you're in a fight? This is this is the payoff for all the hours and hard work in the gym. This is the reason you do it. This is what you're looking for, and he's having fun doing it. It's so funny, you become accustomed in a lot of places we are, particularly early in the prelims. You can sort of eavesdrop in the corner and get a feeling, but <laughs> here in Dublin, we can't hear it all. Nope. Blue, you good? Ready, good, round two. Your 
less than two hours away now from going live on Showtime. Main card featuring a co-main event that we have been targeting for a very long time. Really nice inside kick by Sully that landed hard and a beautiful knee coming up. Right now he's feeling pretty comfortable in the stand-up with what we're both landing kicks here, but Soli's the guy who is feeling more comfortable right now in the stand-up. Not that Pele's not doing well, but Soli's flowing just a little smoother. Nice digging of the underhook by Bobby Pele to get it back to that neutral position. We saw from here, even with that overhook, Soli likes to go for the outside. He'll do the reaping sweep. So, right Tell now, Tell everybody what that is. He's going to be taking that, well, from the position he was just in, he would have taken his right leg and swept it across both legs of Bobby Play as he wrenched that overhook up and over to bring him onto the bat. He wasn't able to do it. He switched positions. Once he gets those hands together, you've got a great chance. He's still in a position, his hands are together. He's got it on the wrist. He should get this takedown from this, but Bobby doing a great job. He's got that underhook. That was a lot of strength, but a lot of effort. Good work by Bobby Pella. Is Nico Soli going for things here that he doesn't really have? He's working very hard and kind of using too much energy in the way he's doing. He's trying to overpower someone who I think is physically stronger than him. Don't do that. Use your technique. Wait for your opportunities. Look for the openings when you can actually. There's that toss I was talking about right there. In judo, they call that a hard gauche. He wasn't able to reap the leg across both legs like he wanted to. Bobby plays into that. He's got double unders. That's why he ends up getting that takedown. Nice inside trip. Now, in the first round, Soli landed the better shots from this spot. And there wasn't a lot of offense from the top. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if we see the same thing. Someone is cut. Yeah, we got some damage. And it is definitely uh, yeah, Bobby Pelé. Bobby, yep. One of those elbows got him. Oh, he had a, had a chance at the sweep right there. The reversal wasn't able to make it work. But now the blood is going to start to make things a lot slipperier. The attacks are not going to work as well. You try to bring the high guard, it's going to just slide right down to the hip area. Things are going to change a little bit just based wow. upon the plasma that's now yeah, hit the canvas. Bad one. Elbow to the top of the head over the right eye. And again, not a lot of offense from Bobby in the top position. Going to the body there. But he's looking to just pass by bringing his leg up. That's yeah. never going to work no, with not. what he has. Keep them clean. The second straight round, while he ends up on top, clean. it's Soli that's landed the better of the shots, well, as you can see. And you can see, look at where he's at with a gable grip, holding on, putting pressure, but there's no chance of you doing anything. You can't land a strike, and you're not going to get a submission there. So really, you're the one slowing the fight down. Going after the arm. For the arm. Again, all that blood made it slippery. That's why he was able to slide out, but Nicola comes up on top. Very little time. Clarify this at the end of the round. You don't consider pressure offense. Not at all. It can be that way if you're in a dominant right, position, but not from the guard where he was at.
Right, it begins with a takedown, but it's the elbow from the bottom that opens him up. It did, and this was double unders. Look at the inside trip. You saw him bringing his leg inside and to the outside. Gets the leg, but then the elbows from the bottom by Soli. This is what starts. Look at that inside elbow right there. That's Another the inside elbow right there. And you see yep. the, the blood starting to come. Watch this shot. That was one right on the top of the head there. Here comes the one across. And he just gets opened up by it. It's just slowed down right now. There it is open. Knew this time that was coming. Let's see, uh, elbow to the top of the head. Just to wipe any of the Vaseline off because they can't reapply it. That's okay. Tell everybody what John Ingle just said about the Vaseline. He said, be careful of wiping the Vaseline away because they cannot reapply it. I mean, the cut man put the Vaseline there because he's taking Adrenal 1000, which is going to stop the flow of blood, Good. and he's put Vaseline Good. on top of it Round. to make that seal. And if that if it doesn't get touched, it's going to hold and it's not going to bleed and it won't get it have any effect on the fight. But as soon as the doctor starts to move it off and pull it away so he can see the cut, which there's no reason to see the cut. You can see that it stopped. That causes it to bleed. And look at what's coming down the back of Clay's head. Okay, that happened. That happened, but someone made a huge mistake. Where they really, really struggle with Matt. Either that or someone's got a slingshot in here and has just incredible aim. Did someone let Josh over do the thing? <laughs> There you go. The, the irony here, and irony being the wrong word, is that we talk about bad cuts that eventually affect your vision. This is so high and on the back of the head, it's going to go the other way. Yeah, and it can, especially in the position where you know, this is where when you have doctors, they want to see, but a, a, a solid ringside position, someone that's been doing this a lot, would never have touched that closed cut. He would have looked at it, seen that it's closed, look at the size of it, and said, it's not in a bad spot, I'm going to let the fight go on. That doctor wanted to see it, and he started to wipe away, and that's why John English said what he did. Have you ever seen a fight stop? These are big shots by Soli. Very nice. Beautiful combination for cut, goes to the flying knee which always draws a bigger reaction from the crowd than it usually warrants. Have you ever seen a fight stop from a cut in the back of the head? I have seen one from a cut in the back of the head, but it was caused by the cage, huh. which bad equipment. It, it actually cut the fighter open up with a big gash, and so it was bad equipment that caused it. So. And it was not in Bellator, I want to say it was, it was in a promotion. It was in a foreign promotion, but these things happen. This is where you try to check everyone's cage that, as an official. That's your responsibility. Did you just play the Gus Johnson, these things happen in MMA? I never play Gus Johnson. He's too good for me. Soli right now is starting to really just land the cleaner shots. It's not that Bobby's not in this fight, and it can change in a moment's notice. But Soli was landing good, clean combinations. He's not usually right there. He's throwing one, but we've been seeing a lot of varied attacks. Nice shot, good body attack right there. Bobby going after the takedown now. It's interesting with Soli because the wild stuff the home run shots haven't hit, but he's hit plenty of singles. Oh, yeah, and it's, you know, all the basics are working for him, so stick with those basics.
Is it important to tell the fighters you're making that call so that one of them doesn't let their guard down if they thought a shot might have been low? Yeah, what you're trying to do is the, you're having some of this. He felt something kind of looking at you, and he's like, no, 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 that was good. Keep fighting if you want to fight because you don't want them to think you're going to come in. They in the take place. their, let their guard down, and they get hit by something. Interesting to see how the judges scored the first round. It will be. It's been a close fight with both guys yeah. having their moments. Overall, I think that Nico has been able to land the cleaner shots. Oh, that was a big telling moment that Bobby missed that takedown. He was looking towards a lateral drop. It did not work for him. And Soli is now in the top position. Again, going back to the 10-9 conversation, you can make an argument this is a 30-27 fight. But the three, they were close rounds. All of them. And, and if you were going to say, okay, we're going to do a half point system, this could be where, yep. it, yeah, you get a 30, and you have that 28.5 showing that, hey, it was close. And nobody wants to call around even in a three-round fight. I always say that if you're gonna, you know, an even round is usually one of the most boring rounds, and you called one of those. Uh -huh. We were just talking ago. about it at lunch today. Rafael Carvalho and Melvin Manoff from 2016. It was the first time as a referee I looked and I said, that's an even round. Because yeah. no one landed any. Yeah, it wasn't even round. You know what the score was? 0-0. Zero, zero. <laughs> Nice job by Nico opening up there. That's just been the difference. The output of Soli in this fight, I think, is going to get him the win. Final seconds. The crowd and the damage will tell you that Soli is going to come out on top, but it's two hard-working kids for 15 minutes. Kick with a punch and return on the counter by Soli. Pallet throws heavy, but Soli's the one that comes with the combination. That's the difference. A guy throwing threes and fours, and then the beautiful flying knee compared to a guy throwing singles. Fan spidey sense goes up when it takes a long time to get the judges' cards as it is here. Anytime I say I'm, I'm sitting and I'm waiting and waiting, I go, all right, it's a split decision, so we have no idea which way this is going to go. And I'm not saying this is, but it always seems like. Uh, because as we've been discussing, the math adding up three rounds it's should a rough take one. this long. <laughs> We could get a third grader to come in here and no, maybe do some of the math. If that's the problem. This is when words like majority start getting discussed. He goes solo. All right, bring it in, guys. The math is done, and Michael C. Williams has it. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now. To your three judges at cage side, your first, Marcel Varela, scores the fight 30-27. He sees the fight for Soli. Your second judge at cage side, Ben Cartledge, sees the fight 29-28.
He scores it for Pellets. Your third and final judge, Chris Lee, scores the fight 29 to 28 for the winner by split decision, Nicolo. What did we just say? Yeah. And you could have seen this fight as a 30-27 or seen it the other way. It's exactly the way it played out, which is why it's a good thing there are three judges. And that's why you have three judges. I know people get upset by that. But until you actually sit in that seat yep. and get only one view, sometimes the, everything that happens happens on the far side and you get the back shot, you don't see the things that land, and that can make the difference of your score. Three judges who score in a fight three completely different ways, but Nico Soli gets the win and goes to four and one. Aiden, we are just getting started tonight. You bet we are, Sheldon. As you said, we are less than two hours out from our main card live here at Bellator 270 in Dublin. We have a four-fight main card on the way. We are on Showtime at 5 Eastern. That's 2 Pacific. And there is so much at stake across the divisions at featherweight. Two former title challengers look to get back into contention with the veteran Daniel Weichel facing Pedro Carvalho at bantamweight. It's a battle of two highly ranked submission specialists as hometown hero James Sabanimo Gallagher throws down with patchy no love mix. And to say there's no love lost in that one is the biggest understatement of the year. And in our main event, a rematch between the showstopper and the pit bull to crown the new Bellator MMA lightweight champion. In. For more on this monumental matchup, here's Jeanette with Gareth A. Davies. Thanks so much, Aiden. Gareth, we are in for a treat tonight. When when Quigley walks out here, it is going to absolutely erupt, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's going to be like a jumbo jet taking off. There's no doubt about it. They are the best fans in the world. They support their fighters. And Peter Quigley is a Cinderella man of MMA. He's, he's someone who you want to support. And let's not make bones about this. Yes, he defeated Patricio Pitbull. Uh, Patricky Pitbull, rather, back in May, second round doctor stoppage. But this is a guy, who, uh, Josh Thompson can forgive me for saying this, he's got a victory over Josh Thompson. He's got a victory over people like Benson Henderson. A massive 10-year career in Bellator, and he's a really dangerous opponent. It's how Peter Quigley uses this crowd to lift himself tonight on an occasion where he can become, like Conor McGregor, a world champion at lightweight. And he's been in that masterful shadow all those years. And as I say, he's climbed the mountain he fights the hardest guys in the gym he's a very special man and everybody wants him to win but listen Patrick is gonna have to take his chances tonight his brother of course gave him the pathway towards this the first Irish man Queenie will be to to fight for a world title here but Patrick is not gonna make it easy for him no there's there's no way he's gonna make it easy for him he's also got a little bit of ire over the fact the fight was stopped last time he wanted to carry on but look this is a moment of destiny We've got Sinead Kavanagh fighting Chris Cyborg next week. Could be an amazing week for Irish MMA and European MMA. Peter Quigley needs to be not the show stopper, but the show stealer tonight. And that's what he needs to go out to do. Aggressive, make it a dogfight, take it into the later rounds, in my view. Oh, what a prospect we've got inside tonight. Sean, over to you. All right, Jeanette. It's, you know what? It's everything we hope for in fights to have an environment like this for fights that are going to be so significant you know it's always fun to watch the heavyweights particularly when you have one who's had eight professional fights and has never seen not the third round but the third minute and now we welcome uh, the kung fu panda charlie milner no doubt indeed when that we Charlie Milner's coach said, well, two things you love to do, eat and fight. You remind me of that Kung Fu Panda. When your coach is calling you Kung Fu Panda, that's a good thing, because Daniel Cormier was called Kung Fu yeah. Panda. Come on, man, you can... This is the one thing that I love about the fighting game is everyone looks for the body. They look for the Greek god. Take a look at a guy named Tyson Fury from England. That's a world championship body, and so that right there for Charlie Miller, that should give him hope. He's got a world championship body. Get yeah, Greek god, that's not even Greek yogurt. <laughs> And now his opponent, Gokun Sadichov. No 
Belgium born, raised in Istanbul, Turkey. John, we have seen him before inside the Bellator cage. We have, he's fast with his hands. He's, he's not that super big. He's that hybrid heavyweight that everyone's looking at now. His last fight, he looked fantastic. Dominant positions, look at bring heavy hammer fist and hammer fist hurt and then brings the leather. He is a good fighter. He's fighting, he's training with great guys at Gegard Mousasi. And let me tell you, when he goes after you, you know that you need to do something offensively to stop what he's trying to get at. Sorry, Chubb has never made it to round three. Charlie Miller has never made it to minute number three. They want to Stay tuned, don't wander far from the laptop. Our tape for this heavyweight championship, not fight, just kidding, heavyweight fight here at Bellator. Take a look at the weight, and this is the real difference. We get a lot of hybrids now, the guys that are in the 225s to 245s, and the big guys tend to have a problem with the speed. We'll see if that is the difference in this fight. I will take that monster energy with me right now. You can't <laughs> I'm getting all excited. To Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at 3 Arena in Dublin, we move into the heavyweight division, scheduled now for three five-minute rounds, introducing the blue corner. At six foot five, weighing in 263.2 pounds, his professional record, seven wins, just one loss, fighting out of Eastbourne, England, Charlie Kung Fu Panda Milner. And across the cage, his adversary, out of the red corner, at six foot three, weighing in 236.4 pounds, as a professional, five victories, just one defeat, Istanbul, Turkey, Gokhan, Sarichan. And when the bell rings, the referee in charge, John English. It's a red corner crowd tonight. Red, you good? Blue, you're good. Round one. Come on. And immediately, Sarchem chops him down with a leg kick. I was going to say that Sarchem's going to try to actually keep this on the feet because he's much faster. Oh, he's in trouble. Big, big trouble, and we're done. And one of the fastest knockouts in Bellator history. Fifteen. Fifteen seconds to chop Charlie Milner down. Take a look at the violence that starts here. Watch the kick that takes Charlie Miller off his feet. All of a sudden, he's into him, and he didn't just sit there. He went after him. Big shot right there. You can see that hurt. You saw the movement of the legs and then opens up and he puts him out. Charlie Milner trying to get himself back, tries to guard up, but it's the big elbow right there and then heavy shots from Gohan. He goes after him, vicious, and 15 seconds worth of damage. And only 15 knockouts in Bellator history have been faster. And you're talking about over 2,000 fights. And Charlie Milner was helpless on the ground in the last five or six seconds. And you see the result. Fifth knockout in his six wins. Adrian Elizam, Baba sizi çok seviyor.
good sign after a scary moment or two for Charlie Milner. I wonder how much damage was done to that leg. You see leg kicks often early in fights. You rarely see the first leg kick of a fight take a fighter off his feet. Near record time, Michael C. Williams will give you the number. Ladies and gentlemen, the devastating end comes just 15 seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout, Goku Sonny Shaw. You come close to making history inside the Bellator cage. He gets to go one on one with Big John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with your winner, Gokun Sarka. You came out, landed a heavy leg kick, and went after him with vicious intent. Talk to me about what you were thinking coming into this cage, because this crowd loved you when you walked in here. Uh, first, hello, Ireland! Hooray! Yeah, uh, I uh, spoke with my coach. And, uh, we expect to do this, and uh, it works. It, it, uh, oh, it worked! It worked. <laughs> and uh, it was his game plan, you know, for the takedown, good position, and uh, finish the fight with Grand Pond. Take a look up on the screen right there. You'll see when you went after him. Yeah. Put him on his back and vicious <laughs> elbow, and then big shots. Yeah. Today uh, I looked much to Khabib, you know. I say I'm gonna do the same. <laughs> well, if you were looking towards Khabib, you you picked a good guy to go after. In the heavyweight division, who is it you would like to meet in this cage next? Uh, today, I prove uh, I can uh, wrestle, I can fight on the ground, I can do everything. I'm ready for this. Give me some uh, top five guys. I come for the belt. I come to the top. Sounds good to me. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for your winner, Gokhan Sharakhan. A man with a plan and a man with a 15-second knockout win on the big stage inside the Bellator cage. A 15 second knockout, guys, Daniel Weichel's last six fights have all gone 15 minutes. Is that gonna happen again tonight? You bet, and he is uh, determined. He told us during the week, in fact, he's almost fed up that his fights are going the distance. We are gonna talk about our second fight on the main card tonight in Bellator 270. It is Daniel Weichel, the veteran, against Pedro Carvalho. Uh, both fighters are looking to kick on in the rankings, maybe get another shot at the title, Josh. When you talk about Daniel Weichel, a man who's had over 50 fights, 40-plus wins in a 20-year professional career. How can you sum the guy up? He's a technician, and that's why he's been able to have such a long career. I'd like to, like, pat myself on the back a little bit as well. Is when you start to develop the technique that carries you throughout your career, as long as you're a technician, you're not powering through things, you're not throwing heavy shots, you're getting yourself out of position that potentially gets you knocked out. Those are the things he does very well. When he fought Keone Diggs, he was able to just touch Keone in positions where Keone left himself out of position. And Keone is a really great fighter. Someone with great tenacity comes forward, brings a lot of pressure. Dale Weichel was able to stop all of that pressure, touch him with the hands, mixing up the kicks and the punches together. He was someone that took Keone Diggs out of his game plan, and that's what he does to almost everyone. Well, we know Pedro's been in with the former champion, Patricio. What's he going to face tonight? What is Daniel Weitzel going to bring to the table that he that Pedro's not seen before? I don't know if I can say that's anything. Like, he's just going to bring himself. All he is, he's a technician. I think if Pedro's going to have to have success tonight, he's going to have to get him out of that technician position. So he's gonna have to be able to touch him, do things that keep him loyal to his defense. And I'm gonna talk about that later as well uh, in one of the other fights. What he's gotta do, he's gotta make sure that he's using that body kick. He's gonna throw those heavy hands. He's gotta be very accurate with his striking and what he needs to do, the main thing he needs to do is get his head offline when he throws punches. When you saw him fight Patricio, he left his head right in the middle as he was throwing, and that's what cost him the fight. If, if you put him in there, he's got to throw the body kick, mix it up with the hands, and then come back with some takedowns or stuff the takedown and get to the top position. He, in his first four fights for Bellator, was nasty. 
That's what he needs to do is get back to that, but also be very weary of his defense when he does it. All right, he's 10 years the younger. Could you make the argument that he's the hungrier fighter here tonight? No, I can't make that argument because Dale Weiss was a stud. All right, that, that ends that. We will wait to see how that plays out on our main card a little later on. But now, let's see if we're going to see any more spectacular knockouts on our prelims. We may very well, Aiden, as we move to the light heavyweight division, where early next year, we will see Vadim Nenkov and Corey Anderson fight for the Grand Prix title for a million dollars and maybe the title of best 205er in the world. Now a couple of veterans at 205 go head to head. And now set to make his way to the cage, Arunas Andrus Kapitschus. Arunas Sanju Kavichis is a fascinating individual because he can, first of all, John, do this in the cage. Oh, he can fight. There's no doubt about it. He's also very intelligent. You can say why. Well, you may have an appointment with him on Monday because he's an attorney. And not to mention being a freelance model. And, you know, obviously you and I know all yeah, about, we know that. All about that. that. But he's had a fascinating, as a result, he took a lot of time away from what was a very promising MMA career. He's 15 and four in his career, and that was after losing his first two. But he has actually won eight in a row. This is a fighter who, including the time away to pursue that law degree and start professional practice, he has literally not lost in 12 years, having won eight in a row. Exactly, he has not lost since 2009. He is good everywhere. He trains with the London Shoe Fighters. He is a solid fighter in the stand-up. He's got a great ground game. He is a handful for anyone in the light heavyweight division. And now making his way, Lee the Butcher. Sixty-nine 69.5 inch reach compared to 76. That says a lot about how long Arunas is compared to Lee, but Lee likes to be the brawler. He likes to get inside, and he likes to throw his hands. Live tonight here in Dublin, Ireland, we thank all those for joining us on BBC iPlayer as we get set now here at the prelims to go three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot three, weighing in 205.4 pounds. His professional record 15 wins, four losses by way of Vilnius, Lithuania. He fights out of London, England. Arunas Andrus Kavitschas. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 205.6 pounds. The veteran professional brings 26 wins, 15 
defeats one draw from Liverpool, England. Lee, the butcher. Brian Miner get the most positive reaction to the three guys in there. <laughs> well, when, you, when you're from England and you're fighting here in Ireland, sometimes they just don't love you the same. You ready? You ready? One thing the Irish love is a good fight, so that's all it's going to take, and they'll be exactly. cheering for both. It is. It's a city. If you haven't made it yet on your bucket list, it, it belongs there. We're just being a little lax with that left hand down low by his hip. Lee Chadwick has power, and if he steps in, brings that right hand across, he can land that. And he can end the fight at any moment. He's got that kind of power. Juskevic is the long layoff. Longer than a lot of guys who fought either in late night, late 2019, or early 2020 before the pandemic. He last fought in early February 2019. Chance of bouncing off the fence for that jump knee, but Lee Chadwick caught it. And this is where Lee likes to fight. He loves to get into the clinch. He likes the dirty box. He likes to get the fight to the ground with him in the top position. So expect him to try to keep this fight exactly where it's at. Now that length means nothing. To the London shoot fighters who he's trained with. Mike Shipman, obviously MVP, coming off the biggest win of his career. Last month in London. Great head positioning right now by Lee Chadwick, using that head as a third arm, forcing Arunas to be up against the cage with his head in a position where he doesn't really want it to be. He had to get out of there, and he did. See just those left hands. Take a look at the right side of Marunas' face. It's pink. It's starting to swell a little bit. He took some shots. Wild swings there, but the double unders. Double Lee unders. Chadwick, yeah. He's got those hands together, so this is a good opportunity for Lee Chadwick to use his strength, suck the hips in, and decide if he wants to bring Arunas down backside or if he wants to run him towards the position that he's at right now and use it a trip to bring him down. He's got a great opportunity here. Andrew Skavich is asked about being an attorney and a fighter said well both are conflict resolution. Keep punching, keep punching. This is true. Just one's much more successful. Even though the Chadwick has the double unders with his hands locked, he's having a hard time moving Arunas to get himself in a position to get the takedown. Arunas keeps on sagging down on those arms, and right now, those arms are going to start to get heavy. The more that Arunas sags on him, it makes Lee kind of carry his weight. He's using a lot of energy. And it won't take much for the crowd to turn on these two fighters representing the UK. Position off the cage, wasn't able to do it. Now he's free. Good knee to the body. He used the knees to escape. And the real question is when you use your arms the way Lee Chadwick was using them in the grappling, now to go back to striking, they feel heavy, they feel slow. It's a completely different situation. Strike 
You see Lee, Lee Chadwick's mouth is now open. He's breathing out of his mouth. That's not a good sign as far as he's needing to suck more air in. Doesn't mean that he's completely out as far as not in shape. It's just he's saying, you know what? He's working hard. He's just not doing energy. Something. Certainly had the better of round one. Knockouts earlier in his career. And he used them defensively here and then offensively in the first round. Yeah, Rudis knows how to bring the knee up, but it was that knee right there? It landed on the side. Lee is just tough enough to be able to take it. It didn't have that flow through that made him in a position where it jolted him on the jaw. He brings that one to the body. That nice knee to the ribs. Lee felt that. Watch right here. Right inside, you can see that right to the solar plex, clean shot. Both had their moments. It was a close round. Each Havoc has fought four times in Bellator, including fighting Fabian Edwards, who was part of that ill-fated fight that took on so many different forms over the last couple of months and eventually dropped off the card yesterday. I think if you're I actually think the Lee Chadwick won the round. But I think if you're to Andrew Scavengist, you're in a position thinking, okay, I know everything that you do and I'm gonna be able to start to open up and cause you more problems and I am not tired at all. Right there where you saw the right hand thrown by Lee. It was a little bit slow, a little bit heavy. Looping. He keeps pulling his chin. Look at his chin position, Sean. When he's stepping back, that chin is getting high. Right now, it's exactly where it should be. But as he's getting thrown at and he's stepping back, the chin is coming up. That could be a problem. Skevich is clearly, yeah, he's just timing for that jump knee. He's looking for it. But you can go to the well too many times also. You need to be, look for other techniques. You're going to catch him off. Spinning back this attempt. So not as easy against the fight. When you have three or four inches on the guy, spinning back fist, sail right over his head. Can't just do it at your shoulder level. You're going to have to lower the angle of that blow. I think Lee thinks he heard him in that. See how he's pressing the action right now. Andrew Skivish is I think relying on the law of large numbers here. And if I throw 30 of those one of them is going to land. Instead, he's eating more clean shots here in the second round. Uh, that was a nice counter left hand over yeah. the top by Lee Chadwick. He sat there. He saw exactly when Arunas was throwing it. Stepped inside, threw over and around the arm. Nice hook. Coming, that means Chadwick should be able to see it coming. And he almost did it again right there, and Chadwick caught him. Once again, oh, this time 
the up kick. Nice front kick. Yeah. And landed that shot because he came in with something different to set it up. And you see it. Lee Chadwick at this moment starting to gulp there. Yeah, momentum is starting to turn here. Yeah, he's starting to get a little tired. His arms are heavy, and you're seeing those momentary times when all of a sudden he's <gasps> grabbing that air, and that's not a good sign when you're in the middle of the fight. You said this is a 185er regional champion here, 185. It was a nice attempt by Avinskava just to bring the, the right hand and then follow it with that left kick up high. It's the right concept, but he's not throwing it with any intent to do damage against Lee. It's not enough. He's, he's been trying to time big shots. like he's going to throw that knee. You see yeah. Lee going straight back. In. So that should tell Arudas, I can take advantage of that. You know where he's going to go. Two close rounds. That defending back just flipped him a little bit. Front kick that Andrew Skyver just brings up. He brings it up fast, and he is only moving straight back. He tries to off center himself, brings his head off, and look where his hands are at. That's because his arms are getting tired. He's getting a little bit wind in this fight. And this third round is only going to get more difficult. Well, that guy's not taking the stool. Yeah, it doesn't matter. A lot of guys don't want to take the stool because their legs start to get a little bit heavy if they've been getting, you know, eating any kind of leg kicks. It starts to make them to where they feel kind of stiff. So it's just a personal preference. Most things are. <laughs> That's true. Again, one of those fights that feels even through two rounds, but just never know. I would have it even right now. Nice job by Lee. Marunas comes in with that flying knee. It was not a well-timed shoot. You know that had to be the word from the corner. Like he's doing the same thing over and over again. You know it's coming. Catch him. Catch it. Bring him down. Put him onto his back and beat him up where you cannot be damaged. This is exactly what Lee needs. Shoulder strikes. At this moment, Andrew Scavenge just he needs to get rid of that closed guard. Open up his legs, get his feet on the hips, try to turn the position, but don't stay here in guard because you're actually holding Lee Chadwick on top of you. And as time goes by, he's just going to keep getting farther and farther ahead of you in this fight. You can hear Chadwick's corner say, keep working, Lee. Lee's tired, and so he's trying to pick his moments when he can attack. What you'd like to see right now is Lee put his head in the middle of the face of Arunas and posture himself up, post up on those legs so he can land big shots. He's thinking about it. And 
Ruiz trying to change the angle so he can start to move the position. Lee crushing the hips, stopping that movement. Juskevich is hunting for the arm now. He's looking for that Kimura. He's got the grip, and you can see right now that he's trying to pull that out. But Lee has got his, notice he's grabbing his shorts underneath. Yeah. That's legal, well, not, he can yeah. grab his own. Yeah. He's trying to protect his arm, because now Lee's in a position he's completely defensive, even, even though he's in the top position. And you see that Arunas has to let go of that, because he just doesn't have the strength to pull that free. Jabba Lee had taken the arm away so he cannot post up and get back to his feet. Flattens him back with his back onto the canvas. Nice move. But again, not doing a lot of offense as far as trying to strike or do something in a submission fashion to end the fight. Right now he's more controlling the fight. You see in the room, this is landing the shot. Get him on both sides, he's only got one arm. Turn him with your head, smoke your head. Turn with your head. Good That's underhook nice. by Arunas. Now he has the opportunity to use an elevator sweep, go to an electric chair sweep. A lot of things he can do to get himself out of this position right now. He goes back to striking. Explain the electric chair sweep. Well, the electric chair sweep is you're going to end up splitting the opponent's legs and rocking him back and forth. But the problem is he's only got one direction he can go based upon the cage. But he's in a, what we call a lockdown on that leg, which is keeping, you know, Lee Chadwick's in a position where he can't get out of where he's at, but it's keeping Lee Chadwick on top. Now he could go for an arm in, but he's he now he's got on the wrong side of the fence. And Lee Chadwick using shoulder pressure right now, trying to just put a lot of pressure down. And Arunas is in that lockdown position. And again, lockdown can be good if you're trying to move your opponent, but if you can't move him with it and let go of it, attempt another section, use the cage to get yourself back to your feet. Lee's doing a great job of keeping him where he's at, but he is only winning control, which is not what the judges are really looking for. Again, going towards the Kimura. This makes Lee completely defensive. He's just trying to stop Arunas from being able to pull his arm out. And so Arunas, a big explosion right there trying to get it out. Can't do it. Lee's too strong and has a hold of his own shorts, which is blocking him. The fans will not be pleased. This will go to the judges who have kind of a complicated call here. Being on top is not necessarily a winning offensive position. No, it might be that, you know, Lee Chadwick, who took the fight to the ground there, he did absolutely no damage to Arunas. And he lost a lot of the time battles as far as Arunas at least was going after the Kimura. He went after things. He was trying to punch. This is going to be a tight one. 2-1. 2-1. And Lee, Lee right there saying 2-1, knowing yeah. he won the, you know, the first round. I think he lost the second. Yep. And he's thinking that he won the third because he was in the top position. Yeah. But just being in the top position doesn't mean that you're going to get that nod by the judges. Come on, Bill Burn. Andrew Skevich just was fighting like a guy Let's who go. may have felt like he was go behind go. hunting for a late submission with that well. Kimura, but he was moving. He was working. Well, and really what you got to no, think no, no, about no. is the judges are no, looking no, no. at the striking, the grappling, which Tommy, took Tommy place and more. And there, are you going to say Teammates. that Lee Chadwick Bunches. was better in the grappling because he was in the top position or was Arunas more prevalent in the grappling based upon he was going after submissions even though he didn't get them? Wanted to finish. This is what makes judging hard. More math Today's issues. Which is telling you what? 
Judges saw it all differently. That's what happened last time. We had three judges who saw a fight all three different ways. He stayed like really far away. Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Marcel Varela, scores the fight 29 to 28. He sees it for Andrus Kavichis. Your second judge at cage side, Ben Cartlidge, scores the fight 30 27. He sees the fight for Chadwick. Your third and final judge, Ron McCarthy, 29 to 28 for the winner by split decision. Lee, the butcher, Chadwick. Three different judges, three different scores. For the second time in the last three fights. But Lee Chadwick, by the skin of his teeth and the end of his cardio, gets his 27th professional win. Dave. Thanks, Sean. We are bubbling nicely here in Dublin. The three arena is filling up ever so slowly, but getting ever so noisier, whether the cheering for the fighters or indeed not. But expectations are at an all-time high tonight for both Peter Queeley and James Gallagher. In our co-main event tonight, the Strabanimal, James Gallagher faces his toughest task to date as he faces fellow submission specialist Patchy Mix in a showdown. Well, it's been boiling over all week here in Dublin. Now, Patchy Mix may not have the crowd on his side tonight, but he does have the unbeaten Bellator featherweight Mads Brunel in his corner, and he's standing by now which in it he is indeed with me Aiden um, Mads this is for you a bit different you're in Pachi's corner tonight how is he back there Patchy is super calm and he can't wait to get in there and just yeah do work put on a great performance in front of the Irish crowd I know he's on uh, the other guy's home turf but Patchy is ready and that's the thing about Patchy he's a cool calm collected character what's it gonna take tonight for him to be able to do the business What's his, what is it, it's going to take for him is just go in there and be himself. Just show up as Patchy Mix and everything's going to be all, all good. And for you to be in the corner, I know it must give you a bit of itchy feet. How are you feeling looking in and how are you feeling within yourself? It's a little weird being on the other side because I usually like really never coach. But yeah, it gives, gives me the itch to, to get back in there as soon as possible, especially when I see this arena. And yeah, it's, it's super cool. And to help a teammate like Patchy, it's always good. And you found your home here with Bellator, a brand new contract signed. It means you can start planning. So what could we be expecting from you? I would really like to be back in like uh, February next year. Yeah, get a scrap in in February. Anyone in particular? I don't like to call out names today. Today is about Patchy. So yeah, I'm here for Patchy today. Okay, well, we look forward to seeing you in Patchy a bit later. Sean is back to you. All right, Jeanette, Matt Brunel on that championship path right now in that featherweight division. And AJ McKee, and Adam Borch, and the former champion Patricio Betbo. We're going to move to 155, where when this night is over, we'll have a brand new lightweight world champion. It's Peter Creeley, one of his training partners, about to get some action in. And now set to make his way to the cage, Brian Hohe Bowie. From the Netherlands, and combat sports called your name. You're coming via kickboxing. And even to this day, Ryan Hui trains with some of the top kickboxers, the Dutch kickboxers, and you know the names, John, the, the legendary names that go on and on. And it's just, it's part of that culture. Oh, the reputation of Dutch kickboxers is known worldwide. You're talking about guys that are just incredible. Guys like Peter Ernst, Ernesto, who's just some savages. But I'm just telling you right now, this is a guy who's been, he's been told that he can't fight in the Netherlands anymore because he went and took a fight in another place and they got, uh, there's a whole thing going with him, but this kid can fight. I'm telling you, Brian Hoyt is good everywhere. 
his stand-up is exciting. He's explosive. He's got a good ground game. He's got good wrestling. He's got submissions. He's a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. This guy is just fun to watch. And now to make his way, Daniele Scott Scottese. Take a look at that reach. I was just talking about it, 69 and a half to 76. Brian Wee's got outstanding stand-up skills. Skatizi, very good on the ground. This is the, the old sat adage of striker versus grappler. To Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at 3 Arena, the Bellator 270 prelims are now set for three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 156 pounds even. His professional record, 16 wins, 8 losses from Willemstad Curacao. Presenting Brian Hawi And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5 foot 10, weighing in 155 pounds as a professional. 10 wins, 5 defeats. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland, Daniele Scadisi. Your referee in charge, Brian Miner. I feel like telling everyone I'm broadcasting out of Dublin, Ireland tonight. That seems like the, <laughs> the easy way to get the cheap pop, right? That's it. That crowd you're looking at behind these two fighters is going to play a major role tonight. Nice start for Skatizzi. Yeah. Beautiful Front kick. kick. That was trying to use his hands and those kicks to get himself to the inside. There he is reaching for that takedown again. But he's going to have to be very careful. Nice sprawl by Hui. Skatizzi being tenacious going after it. Boy, he was so active early in his career, but as you said, he's had trouble getting fights. He fought 24 times in four and a half years. He's only had one fight in the last three and a half years. Yep. You have a, a fighter having trouble getting fights at home combined with the pandemic, and that will derail any momentum we might have had. Still young, still just 26. Exactly. Everyone there knows how dynamic he can be, but he's always been in this position where guys can take him to the ground and keep him on his back, get the win against him. That blueprint's out there, and that's what Skatizi's looking at and trying to follow. Just take a moment to think about the year and a half in the fight sphere when you are in this environment that we've already had tonight, and we are still an hour plus away from going We're live on Showtime with James Gallagher walking out and. Peter Quirley is going to be a moment. I mean, start getting on social media now. You're going to want to be in front of your TV and have it on Showtime when Peter Quirley walks for the title fight in the main event. And I think in just in general, there is just more appreciation among crowds everywhere as they get to be crowds. Yeah, they actually get to go and enjoy themselves and be out and 
see great competition. There's nothing like it. We, we have to get back to that. Whatever norm's going to be, we got to get back there, and that's what this is tonight. Love the pressure that Skatiz is trying to bring. The boy has been outstanding at stopping everything he's tried so far. We'll see if Skatiz can get him down off of the fence at this time. Skatiz, three time Italian Cup grappling champion, brown belt in judo, is trained with Peter Quirley. Right there, he needs to lift that elbow up and start to spin himself out. Wasn't able to do it. Here comes Katizzi getting elevated him. Not a good slam, but he got him down. But right away, Hui back to his feet. Katizzi used a real nice short elbow there to set up that takedown. As you say, Hui needs to let go of the head, go right to that Kimura grip that at least will stop Katizzi from being able to complete take down at that moment but he's just tenacious and I love what I'm seeing out of Skatizi. He has not stopped with the pressure and eventually it will grind Hui down to the point where he ends up hitting the ground. You really like this fight. When you were talking about prelims. I did like this fight just in the contrast. I've been yeah. in there with Skatizi. I know how tenacious he is. Look, he's not that guy that's going to be, you know, in a stand-up battle with someone throwing bombs and getting the big knockout. But he's the guy that just sticks to his game plan and works it to the point where he outlasts his opponent and just systematically works towards getting that win. And boy, boy, I will tell you, he's exciting. He's explosive. He can end the fight at any moment. So that makes it a just a fun fight if you're looking to say which one's going to be good. This one should be good. Kick to come inside, throws his hands, but look at how calm Brian Hui is. He's just nice and relaxed. He's so good in the stand up, so relaxed there, doesn't worry about getting hit. Nice body shot. Everything Skatizi has thrown has been in combination. Some of the action here. It's a beautiful elbow. Uses the elbow up high to get the attention and make the reaction. The hands coming up and then drops his level. Take a look. Boom. Watch the level drop. Nice, beautiful work. But he's still even at that point. Although they did hit the ground momentarily, Hoy was able to get himself back to his feet and continue to make Skatizi work hard at trying to get him back to the ground. Talk about the guys who wear the love of this sport written on their face. Ryan Hoy literally has it written on his face. He knows what he wants to do. He's a nice high kick by Skatizi, and he's opening up. He is trying to use those strikes to get himself into the grappling range. But right now, Hoy is not respecting the power of Skatizi in any fashion. He's just basically walking it down, letting him sit, letting it get hit to try to land his own shots, and he's attacking the body well. Low 
those singles. Hearing those singles. That's something you don't see many times. That was what Randy Couture took James Tony down with. But right now, we work it. Teasy sticking onto that single leg. He needs to make him carry his weight. Put a lot of pressure down. You see Skatizi trying to sit himself into guard. He almost, he's put himself almost into a guillotine position. He was trying to use that butterfly guard that that's a good position to defend from it's a good position to get the reversal but when Hoyt ended up passing that leg he got to switch right away you see he's still got that elevator hook on that left leg you saw Hoyt shake it off but this is even though Hoyt's in the top position he doesn't want the fight here against Skatizi. he wants to get himself back to his feet or be in the top position right here where he can land shots for ground position he's advancing to strike yeah he, that's his whole concept of how do you win a fight on the ground it is to punch a hole in your opponent to the point where they can no longer continue again beautiful elbow by Skatizi. but everything that he throws Sean everything boys basically walk through yeah Feel it out in the first couple of minutes. He's like, I don't think he can hurt me on the feet. So you've seen Hoy much more aggressive in round two. <laughs> nice job of pulling him around. You see him taking that arm, reaching all the way around the head, almost grabbing the ear and turning. Beautiful technique by Brian Hoy to change that position. Again, rips the body. Those body shots are going to start to pay dividends. He's starting to drop his head down. He's getting tired. Teasy's only been stopped twice in 15 pro fights. Boy, really looking for a shot. He's a big shot. He, that he did not see that one coming. No, he did not. He didn't see that at all. And it landed flush. He was not respecting the hands of Skatizi, and he forgot about the foot. Big opportunity for Skatizi here. He wants to be able to take the bat. Right now, this clinch position is good for Hoy because yeah. he can get his senses back. Because that kick definitely separated him from his senses for a moment. Skatizi has been just outstanding with that right elbow in the clinch. Boy, that is some good shots as Katizzi's trying to get this back to the ground, back to the grappling. That's how you do it. Trying to get a hook in, but can't. All that time we were saying, look, Hoy's just walking through his shots and everything, figured I can take anything you can throw. Skatizzi proved everybody wrong. By landing that kick. Boy, shots coming just a little bit slower now towards the end of round two. It's a good round for Hoy for the first three minutes. Great round for both fighters at times. Watch the kick land, man, right along the jawline. The fact that Brian Hoy was able to survive this. Look at this. Boom. Yes, rush. Right on the jaw neck area, you see it stun him, unable to collect his balance. That was a big shot by Skatizi, and amazing that Brian Boy could just work his way through it.
Beautiful right uppercut. We've had some really interesting rounds to judge here so far tonight. Well, that one was a round that was being won totally by Absolutely. Brian Hoyt. But that knockdown and the power that was on it and what it did to affect Hoyt, that's going to sway the judges. That was the most damaging thing that happened in that round. That was the closest thing to ending it. So we're going to see what Hoyt does in this round to keep that from happening and do damage to Skatizi. Nice job, and you saw how Hoyt dug the underhook in the top position. Right there, he just let it up. Now you see Skatiz, he's able to upset his balance. He's got the underhook. He's got the ability to either elevate him and get himself back to his feet or possibly reverse the position. Hoyt stopped it. We're going live on Showtime, top of the hour, with all roads leading to a co-main event that has had this country buzzing for over a month. Peter Creeley and Patricky Pitbull for the lightweight world title. James Gallagher and Patchy Mix. We doing a nice job trapping the arm. He's trying to open up. Skatizi. Skatizi keeps using that elevator hook to control that leg. Very nice work by Skatizi off his back. He's not being in that position where he's just defending. He's still attacking, which is making Hoy have to actually adjust his position and slow down his ability to do big ground and pound. Skatizi just ducked out of trouble there. He's looking to entwine that leg right now. He's got it in position. If he can extend it out now, he's going for the heel hook. Right now, it's in a straight ankle lock position. That should not be where Hoy is going to be in a lot of trouble. A straight ankle lock has got pressure. It's got pain, but you can survive it. A heel hook is damaging. There's a big difference. Hoy back to the top position. He's trying to roll for it. Now he is just defending. That's a dangerous game. There's a chance he won that second round, but no guarantee. No guarantee at all. I wouldn't be surprised that if Skatizi won the second round, but I can see where a judge could go. Yep. Yeah, that one shot was great, but not enough. So this is up for grabs. I love what Hoy is doing right now. He's trying to he's trying to put heavy shots on Skatizi. He knows Skatizi is getting tired. He can feel it. Nice elbow inside. Skatizi's got very good defense on the ground, but right now everything that he's trying to hold on to, you see Hoy being able to slip his arm out, control position, and end up where he's got posture and he can bring power down. That's a nasty elbow. Nasty elbows. Here come the punches from Hoy. Thought, oh, he almost got that kick Same again. Thing, yeah. up. Same time of the round, he's a little too close. Hoy for a second, trying to take the back. Hunting. He's going to win the round, but not the fight here in this third round. It's going to be an interesting call, as many of these have been tonight for the judges. One final exchange. Good stuff. Yes. We thought that was going to be a fun fight. Yeah, it was, was great.
This is going to come down to how much damage the judges thought that kick did late in the second round. It is all going to be about volume of Brian Hoy and what he did compared to damage by Scatizzi. Milan now representing both his home country and Dublin training partner Peter Creeley still growing at age 28 as a fighter well, you've got some stuff for your judging clinics out of this uh, these last few fights just a little bit has been done. Michael C. Williams has it. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone, the distance will go now to your three judges at cage side. All three, Chris Lee, Marcel Varela, and Ron McCarthy. I'll have it exactly the same, 29 to 28. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, the yellow sky. There are 300 seconds in a round, but that one second late in the second round is the reason that Daniela Scatezzi was the winner. Yeah, the landing of that kick, the way it landed, it was vicious. It caused him to almost end the fight. That was the difference. That's why the judges gave it to him. Jaden and Josh. Thank you very much, John. That has really got the crowd going tonight. Well, we're about 30 minutes out from our main card of Bellator 270 here in Dublin. And Josh, we have a new fight to kick off the night tonight on our main card. And when you heard this was announced, you said to me, great fight. Elias the Blade Boulade against George Sassou. Why do you like it so much? I'm still trying to figure out what Sean Grandy said about 300 seconds in a round. I'm doing the math. Just didn't come out right. <laughs> can someone get a calculator out? Neither he, of us can do it. I've called Elias Boulade's fights. He is dynamic. Big John McCarthy and I, he turned me on to, to watching his fights. He is explosive on the feet. He is somebody, when I say, hide your kicks behind your punches, that's exactly what he does. He brings excitement. He brings it all the way around, from the low-level leg kicks to the body kicks to the head kicks, but he mixes everything up behind his hands. He is a technician when it comes to kickboxing. He's absolutely amazing to watch fight. Former kickboxing world champion. It's two years almost since he fought in this very arena. He'll be hoping to make it another win tonight. What uh, threats does George Sassu possess? That's most though for him. Well, so he's extremely good on the feet as well. Sasu is someone who's dynamic on the feet. He likes to do jumping, flying knees. He's very aggressive on the feet. But what he has though over Boulet is he's got a little bit more experience when it comes to the grappling. His exchanges on getting into the body locks, getting the fight to the ground, and able to take that fight to the ground on his own and get in that top position. And I'm having a hard time listening to myself talk right now. It's getting well, we will tell you why because our final preliminary fighters are in the cage and one of them is a hometown favorite shot no doubt another irish spg fighter here in clark and maybe the top prospect of the younger guys in that gym undefeated at 26 years old and this is just the warm-up for what this crowd is going to be like a little bit later and they have been already extremely vocal in support of their hometown heroes As we move to featherweight. Martell the tape for this featherweight matchup. You're going to see a noticeable size difference of Jordan Barton. 3-0 oh for Syrian Clark. 6-1-1 one one for Jordan Barton. This should be an outstanding matchup. To Michael C. Williams. Tonight here in Dublin, Ireland, the time has come to conclude the Bellator 
two seventy prelims will do it now with three five minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot ten, weighing in one hundred forty three pounds. His professional record: six wins, one loss, one draw. Across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing him 145.8 pounds as a professional. He's undefeated at three and oh from Dragon the County Hope, Ireland. Introducing Kirhan Clark. And your referee in charge, Brian Miner. Back up. Good. Good. Ready? Ready? Pop. Aaron Clark. Red corner. He didn't figure that out. Kieran. All three of his pro fights have been in Bellator. Kieran Clark is a ground specialist. He's in the stand-up and he can fight the stand-up, but he wants to get this fight to ground. He's the guy that he's a grinder. You talk about embracing the grind. That's what Kieran Clark does, and he just wears his opponents out. Martin is good in the stand-up and he's good on the ground, so it's not going to be an easy battle to get Martin down there, but here goes Clark. Beautiful tilt, bringing him up. Wasn't able to turn the corner with it. That's why Barton is back on his feet with his back against the cage, being able to use that as a balance point. Stuff the head down. Smart move if you get him. A beautiful yeah. job of scooping the leg out, hooked the leg, brought it out, bringing Barton down to his butt, but still not in a position where he has him controlled there. You see a beautiful figure four on the legs, controlling the legs there, a la Khabib. This is what Karen Clark does in his fights, and he just continues to put a pressure on his opponents that eventually breaks him. Talk about the evolution of the sport. The younger fighters are now watching the Khabibs and that generation that have advanced it. And they're starting with that stuff at 23, 24 years old. Well, they watched what he did and then they start to emulate it. And they're practicing it. And they're getting just as good as he is at this point. You know, it, it becomes something that's like second nature to him. It was second nature to Khabib to figure for the legs. He learned that from Josh Thompson. So. This is, you know, the evolution of the sport. Kieran needs to be careful in just protecting his neck here. He's not real worried about the back take, but he can take some big shots here, so he needs to be careful controlling those arms. Step through. Nice job by Kieran. Nice job by Jordan. To stop that. Keep him up against the cage if that's where he wants him. But I would think that Jordan would want to kind of separate, get some distance, and use the length that he has with his punching power against Clark. Jordan Barton was in this building the first time we came here in December of 2016. He was here as a fan. In his early 20s said, I want to fight here one day. And here he is. This time an inside trip. And able to take that leg, got the single, lifted it up, swept the secondary leg away for the takedown. Barton doing a good job to get back to his feet, but again, now Clark is in the position. This is the grind. Pretty good.
great shot from there. That was a beautiful left hand. And so many decisions being made by Kieran Clark there because he wants to take that posting arm away. But he knows that I can't reach that far because that's going to put me out of position. So many thought patterns and everything going by both guys in this. Right now, great fight. Take down, crowd reacts. Clark is always thinking about the next thing. Well, that's where Clark wins the fight, is he always is in that, I'm going to take you down, I'm going to put you in a position where I can dominate and do damage where you can't do damage to me. That's where right now he's putting Jordan Clark. Jordan Martin, I'm sorry. Great, great job by Barton to get his back up against the cage, but notice that Clark continues to control the legs, and if he controls the legs, Barton cannot get back to his feet. Beautiful work by Kieran Clark. And beautiful job by yeah. Jordan Barton throwing shots and creating problems for him. That was a big hammer fist. He getting himself out, and full marks for Clark here to stay in there. And he, now he ate a couple of elbows here. These are dangerous shots. Stop. A common theme over the last couple of hours, John, is guys getting an offense from the bottom, which forces you to look at a fight differently. Absolutely. You can take a look. Look at what happens here. Nice straight jab to the body. Clark scoops the leg up. Watch him take, and he takes the other leg, scoops it out, gets Barton to the canvas, Barton immediately getting up, and then he brings in a beautiful left hand. This is what I was talking about. He wants to take that post away, but he knows that he can't reach it. So he continues to put his hands together, drive him. There was some great shots landed by both fighters, and Barton off of his back, and it's a big hammer fist. Clark's first round. Yeah, I believe, I believe that's Clark's first round. I think he gets the round. He was the one that controlled where the fight was going to be. He landed some good shots. He ate some good shots. But overall, I thought he had the cleaner round. I thought it should go to him 10 9. Mark Lance is trying to land yeah, some he good is. shots. He's throwing heavy look. This is what happens. You start to throw too hard, you overextend. That gives Clark the opportunity to switch, yeah, he change knew. levels, and put the fight where he wants. He knew right where the opening was, too. You can see it's drops of blood. Obviously, Kieran Clark is bleeding. Not sure if it's out of the nose or where. Right here, he's trying to dig that right leg, but the, there's so much friction on that foot and the way that Barton's able to balance himself using the cage as a balance point and put pressure on that leg. Very difficult and a lot of energy to get it up and out, but that's what Clark's able to do. Over the left eye of Clark is where the damage is, and there were so many shots and those dangerous elbows. One of them was bound to cut Clark, and he did. Nice posture by Clark. Big up kick, another one. Clark has eaten a lot of shots from the top position.
scouting report on Clark was dead on. Because relentless. He is just tenacious on the ground, and I, I watched him in all of his pro fights, and he just keeps coming. And there's guys that can stay and not, and not break. And it is difficult to not break under the pressure that this young man breaks. See Jordan Barton looking for a switch. That's where his left arm is at to try to switch the position. Gives up on that to try to get to his feet. See what Clark is thinking. Trying to get his left leg or Barton's left leg. Trying to hook, he's going to bring it backside. Barton gets his leg free. Nice balance by Barton. Oh, big flying knee by Barton. He definitely got one in. And that right hook caught him. Barton has landed some big shots in this round. Kieran Clark has got a chin of granite. Fans cheer for the takedown, but even they recognize how this round has gone. Got to go by. Look, who is damaged more in the round right now? Right now, it's Karen Clark. He's received some big, heavy shots, the knees, the up kicks. You got to remember all those things that have occurred. He has kept working. He has kept coming forward, but no question, he has taken the bigger shot. And there has not been anything. If you're looking at submission-wise, there's been no submission attempt here. It's Possibility at this point, nothing has put Barton into danger. Man, sort of willing Kieran Clark on at this point, but well, he took a ton of damage in that round. Again, beautiful elbow from underneath. Take a look at that beautiful right hand. That landed clean, and then he brings heavy heat. He's throwing bombs at him. Karen Clark changes level. Look at the elbows to the side of the head. Karen stays with it. Flying, oh, yeah. look at that lift right underneath the chin. That landed clean. The fact that Karen Clark was able to stay on his feet with that shot. My God, he's got a chip. Start if Barton could keep it on the feet, he could win rounds, but he won that round even not on his feet. Nice snatch single. Didn't have enough though for the takedown, which he's been gotten. He's had to work for him, but that one was not close. Clark able to get his hands together there. A lot of pressure. You saw Barton try to drive his hands down. Didn't matter. Just broke the hands apart. Just keep that pressure in here. That's it. Just hard to that right shoulder. Gary Clark has always been able to get guys down into a dominant position. We might be asking the same question about James Gallagher later. What happens if he can't do what he's always done? What's plan B? And again, Clark. Top position, taking shots. Those are some heavy elbows. Those are not light. Those hurt. Nice turn of position. Come out on top. Beautiful reversal by Jordan Barton right there. 
do a lot of damage right here in half guard. Trey Clark gives that back. Trying to get himself back up. Needs to make sure that he hand fights here, keeps himself in a position where the hands can't be used as a striking instrument or get the choke. Now Martin had this position in round one, but Clark wasn't nearly as tired as he is now. And he went for the rear naked choke there, but he didn't have it. Nice job by Kieran Clark. Just nice little shimmy movement. Get him off. All that sweat now working against being able to be like Velcro. Clark needs offense now. That was beautiful movement. You saw Kieran Clark looking at this. Wrap the arm around. He might have been going for a seatbelt, could have been going for the neck, but right away Barton was there at yep. the same time to defend. The way we see it, Kieran Clark has to work here. Both guys have to work because Barton cannot stay in this position yeah. and think that he's going to win this fight. He's got to at least try to work himself out of this position right now. Kieran Clark just needs to stay tenacious, keep on throwing shots, try to open him up, look for the submission. Because Clark here, unlike in the first two rounds when he was on top, Clark is safe here. He was not safe when he in the first two rounds. No, absolutely. There's nothing right now that Barton can really do that's going to damage Clark. Well, Clark can do a lot of damage. He was in what we call a seatbelt position, basically like he put a seatbelt on, arm over the shoulder. That's to control and keep the position. You see Barton trying to turn into him. Body triangle right now. He's turning down the wrong position. You see that foot? That foot needs to hit the ground to give Barton enough space to turn inside of that figure four. The fans hoping that was deep. It was not. Now he sneaks it in. Not super deep. Barton has his chin down. But he's starting to give him some problems with this. Get Barton closer. the position where He's got that body triangle working against him as far as he's not being able to breathe real well. The, the yep. diaphragm's not working the same. He's doing a great job of defending the hands right now. But now he's in trouble. Oh, we got big problems for Barton. That's it. That was as tenacious a performance from a young fighter as you are going to see. The damage he took to finish the fight the way he wanted was incredible. That is as hard earned a victory as you are going to see. That is a big time victory. You saw that body triangle was a big part of it. When Barton decided to move right here, he put himself into danger. Look at where his hands are at. And he thinks that because his chin is tucked, he's not going to be able to get the choke. Well, I'm telling you right now, that will dislocate your jaw. It is painful, and it can definitely put you out. It is not a position where you can relax, where you cannot hand fight. He made a mistake. Kieran Clark took advantage of it. Great win. They're all different. They're all more difficult as you climb the ladder and the first real test of the undefeated young phenom Kieran Clark. He passes with flying colors. Michael C. Williams has the final word. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap by way of a rear naked choke official time, four minutes, 11 seconds, Rob. This place is about to explode tonight.
They cheer Kieran Clark on to his fourth consecutive win. We are going live, top of the hour, on Showtime with one of the most anticipated co-main events in Bellator history. The lightweight world title on the line, Gallagher and Patchy Mix. Join us, top of the hour, on Showtime. An epic rematch touches down in Dublin. The vicious elbows of Peter Queeley. There it is! Are out to stop TKO tactician Patricky Pitbull. It is in the biggest title fight of their lives. Plus, hometown hero James Gallagher looks to take down submission guru Patchy Mix. Wow, Mix! It's a double dose of Dublin destruction. You're running out of luck, bro. Bellator MMA, live from Ireland, today on Showtime, where warriors rule. The lightweight division is the crown jewel of Bellator. It has produced some of the most epic fights in history. Who could ever forget Chandler versus Alvarez or Gertz versus Campo? The list of names that have won the belt is a who's who in MMA. Eddie Alvarez, Michael Chandler, and of course, Patricio Pitbull. But there will be a new name added to that list. First though, we need to look back at the complicated history of this division. Back at Bellator 157 in 2016, Patricky Pitbull faced off against a familiar foe in Michael Chandler for the vacant lightweight belt. He would lose that fight in devastating fashion. This had huge ramifications for the lightweight division and Patricio, Patricky's younger brother, who took it upon himself to confront Chandler and vow to get revenge. Fast forward to Bellator 221 in 2019, Patricio, the underdog heading into the fight, was crowned the new champion after knocking out Chandler in the first round. The unpredictable! Oh! Chandler would leave the promotion without ever fighting Patricio again. And the new king would focus on defending his other belt in the featherweight Grand Prix. However, that tournament would go on far longer than anyone expected due to the pandemic, leaving the lightweight division in limbo. It eventually reached its conclusion with a shocking first round loss for Patricio. who decided to vacate the lightweight belt and refocus his efforts on regaining his featherweight title. In May, Queeley fought and won his first meeting with Patricky via a doctor stoppage at Bellator 258. Neither fighter felt satisfied with that conclusion and vowed to run it back for a definitive ending. With the rematch announced and Patricio vacating the lightweight belt, this paves the way for Patricky, the number one lightweight contender, and Peter Queeley to compete for the ultimate prize, the vacant lightweight belt. And that title will be on the line as the main event of Bellator 270 on Friday, November 5th in Dublin, Ireland. Will Patrick finally earn redemption? Will his 10-year quest for lightweight gold finally end? Or will Ireland gain its second lightweight world champion in Peter Queeley? Let's find out. I came to show up. I think James Gallagher's here. He didn't He didn't step in this cage with me tonight, so I'm ready for July. You know, Jimmy, you said you signed the contract, so let's get it signed this weekend. Give me anyone, everyone, and a big bag of money, and I'll fight any f 
just one of the... James Gallagher in July, unless he keeps running. Give me that belt. It's mine.